It's very exciting to be able to tell you some of the principles of visual perception and attention and some of the work that we conduct in my lab. One of the things that I would like to convince you about today is that perception is an active process. We do it all the time. It seems that we do it effortlessly, but there are thousands of computations that our brain performs every second in order for us to see the way we see. We actually do a lot of inferential processing while we see. So the first thing that I'd like you to do is to see this pattern. To some of you, this pattern is going to emerge immediately. And some of you have question mark faces, and I'm wondering what this is. So probably when I tell you that this is an animal, it's going to start making some sense. And if I tell you that it's a mammal, you start seeing it, right? OK, a y because we're short on time, I want to help you here. What if I say moo? <laughs> ah, you see the cow now, right? OK, a y so here's the face. There's the nose, the two black spots are the ears, and actually the cow is looking at you. Now, the cool thing is that once you see it, there's no way you stop seeing it. I've had students in my intro to perception class that come four years after to visit me, and I have my little cow postcard, and they go, oh, the cow, and then they keep going. So it's pretty amazing. And this is what happens. Uh, this is a very good illustration of how the information that we have helps us see. The physical information that has been impinging upon your retina at the back of your eye has been exactly the same since the slide is on. Nothing has changed. But for those of you that didn't see it, what changed was actually the knowledge that I told you, right? In the moment that we say it's animal, the possibilities are constrained. And once I tell you that it's a mammal, the possibilities are even farther constrained. So even though we're not aware of it, most of our perception every day, it's an inferential process. We do what we call hypothesis testing, very bright, very fast hypothesis testing. You know that we have robots that can beat the best chess players. We don't have robots that can cross the street the way you cross the street. Just remember that, OK? a y We're pretty amazing machines. Now, here are two examples, again, of perception. On the left, can I see hands of who sees, who r e c o g n i z e s a pattern on the left? OK, a lot of people, someone just tell me what you see. Triangle, OK, great. It's all in your imagination. There's no triangle there. Actually, the luminosity that is within the triangle and next to the triangle is exactly the same. What is happening is that your brain is assuming that there are some circles behind it and that the triangle is occluding it. And because the system assumes this, you actually see it as being closer to you and having a higher luminance. These contours that you see don't exist. They're called illusory contours, OK? a y The interesting thing is that if we see what's happening in your brain, the brain is actually responding as if the contours are there. And we do that effortlessly all day long. Now, how do we know this? When we study psychology and we study humans, we don't have the advantage that people that work with animals have, whereby you can get to a neuron of a particular animal, put an electrode, and record the activity. So what we have to do when we work with humans is devise methods and tricks to see how it is that when we manipulate the content of the physical information, our perception changes. So I'm going to do a demo. I want everyone to look at the screen. There's going to be a center. And I want you to look at that blue cross. Please keep looking at it. I'm going to hypnotize you. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> What happens is that the neurons in the back of your brain are getting adapted, and now you see that that pattern seems to change. Again, the particular neurons that respond to that motion are getting tired, and you get an after effect. And as we keep going, you would see that that eye seems to be growing bigger and bigger. Now, nothing has changed, right? But your neurons got adapted. OK, a y now, 
I want to tell you, first of all, about visual perception, because I want to convince you that visual perception is an active process and that our brain performs these amazing computations all day long. But I also want to tell you about attention, because it turns out to be that most of the time we're confronted with an overwhelming amount of information, and we have to make sense of what we see. We have to selectively process certain information. Now, the advantage of processing that information is that we can see better, and I'll show you how that's the case. We can hear better, and I'll show you how that's the case. But that has a cost. And the cost is that what we are not selectively processing, consciously or not of it, is going to be perceived less well. So we're going to do a demo, and it really requires audience participation. So those of you that are towards my left are going to listen to the male's voice. Those of you that are towards my right are going to listen to the female's voice. Okay? You have to make an effort. Male and female coming. Ready? Only 1% of your neurons can be simultaneously active above base memories. level. The great Argentine author Fifty percent of your cortex is devoted to processing visual information. And absolute perception. We are the legally blind beyond the central 80 degrees of visual angle. Ways, unable to think and unable you move to your see. eyes about 160,000 times Borges per day. Suggests, is what enables remembering and thinking. When you attend out of the corner of your absolutely eye, everything perceived contrast, without selection size, and interpretation, and speed, among other leads, dimensions, according to the logic of the short story, to a form the driving of behavior that causes a more kind car of blindness. is talking via headset. Borges insights are on point. Each time we Attention open our eyes, and we are confronted with an overwhelming amount of information. Visual neglect, Despite schizophrenia, this, we experience a seemingly effortless understanding of our visual world. Okay, could you follow the male's voice? Yes. Did you follow the female's voice? Yes, that was a little introduction that I wrote for a chapter on attention some time ago that tells you how se processing is selective, and it has an analogy with a story of Borges that talks about how someone that can remember everything can think very little, because the person cannot forget. The same happens if we have all the visual information represented to the same degree in our brain, there's no way we could make sense of it. We need to selectively filter out or discard some information in order to make sense of the other information. Now, I want to give you a demonstration of how limited our processing is. So on the one hand, it's incredible the computations that our brain makes per second. On the other hand, there's a curious fact, and it is that we have the phenomenological impression or the subjective impression that we perceive everything that is out there, and that we do that really well. So I'm going to show you how that's not necessarily the case, and to some degree how limited our processing is. So I'm going to show you a series of slides. It's, it's two slides that are going back and forth, and I want you to notice the differences between those two images. These are former and current lab members, and you can see, I hope that some of you detect some changes between both. Yes? Okay, if you've seen one or two, you're doing great. We're going to go all the way to nine. Here are the two images. Everything that is encircled in red is where information changed that you didn't see. Now, when I show this in class, usually people get very excited because they get to see one or two changes. I'm going to show you an example that is actually not even flickering, because sometimes people say, well, you know, the world doesn't flicker. Actually, it does. Every time you blink, you don't have access to the external world. Every time you move your eyes, you don't see what happens while you're moving your eyes. Okay? So in certain way, the world blinks, but we have a continuous perception. Now, I'm going to show you an example that is going to have some changes that are happening very slowly, all in front of you, there's no trick here, nothing is flickering, okay? I want you to notice all the changes that you see.
Okay, can you raise your hand if you saw changes? About five? Ooh, less than five. Okay, three. Okay, last time I counted, there were 42. <laughs> so, this is the original image, and this is the final image. I'm going to go back and forth. Anywhere you look, this changed. Okay? Furthermore, I'm going to put them side to side so that you can see what happened. Wherever you look, you will see changes. And I'm serious, I counted 42 last time, and I'm not sure if I finish. Now, why is this the case? Why is it the case that if our subjective experience says that we have access to the world in front of us, things are changing and we don't notice those changes? Well, we've known for a long time that actually our cognitive resources are limited. They're quite amazing, but they're limited, and our perceptual resources are limited too. And not until recently we know that this is actually related to the bioenergetic cost of cortical computation. Let me explain what I mean by it. The high energy cost of neuronal activity that is involved in cortical computation limits our ability to process information. And this is for the following reasons. First of all, there's a constant overall energy consumption that is available to the brain. Our brain, that jelly-like structure that only weighs three pounds, uses 20% of the total energy available to the body. And that's when we are adults. When we're children, it's about 50%. Okay? Now, our cortex uses 44% of the energy that is available to the whole brain, and the brain has to maintain us alive. Now, the neuronal metabolic cost depends on the spike rate. That is, every time that a neuron responds, it's consuming energy. And the cost of a single spike is actually high. For that reason, the average discharge rate of the active neurons determines how many neurons can be active concurrently. All our neurons in our brain are firing constantly to keep themselves alive. They have to fire once in a while so that oxygen gets to them. Okay? Now, a um, colleague and friend of mine did this biophysical calculation, and he calculated how many neurons can be active concurrently above base level. And the answer is quite staggering. It's only 1%. Okay? Now, we have 86 billion neurons, so that's a lot. But only 1% of those neurons can be active. And that is why the brain needs machinery to allocate energy according to task demand. And attention, the mechanism that I want to focus on, is going to be a manager. It's going to help us allocate our limited resources to those things that are important for us in that moment. Now, what are the consequences of these limited resources for everyday visual perception? Well, let's take a visit to the Verrazano Bridge that most of you know. Here we are standing at the Brooklyn end of the Verrazano Bridge, and the Manhattan Marathon is about to start, or the New York Marathon is about to start. Now, we're here at the front, and we're waiting to take a picture of a friend. Now, in reality, we have a lot of processing constraints. So the world in our brain doesn't look like this. It looks more like this. In other words, only at those locations that we are foveating or we're directing our eye, we're going to see a high resolution. But as we move towards the periphery, the resolution gets worse and worse. That is why when you read, you have to move your eyes constantly. Okay? Now, because of this, our eyes are going to be swiveling. They're going to visit different locations, and wherever the eyes are, the quality of the information is going to be better. Now, I'm waiting to take a picture of my friend, but all of a sudden I see this bold guy waving. And I want to know whether he's waving at me or at someone else. Now, now there are two locations of interest for me. One, where I'm looking at, and another on the right, because I know that my friend is going to come on that side. 
So what I do is, while I keep looking to the bold friend, I allocate my attention without moving my eyes to a peripheral location. And regardless of whether we're aware of this or not, we do this all day long. Imagine that you go to a place, to a conference where you have a name tag, you feel embarrassed that you forgot the name of the person because they've introduced you to that person for three times in a row. So you look at the person, you smile, and you're really reading the tag. <laughs> When you're driving, you're looking in front, but you look to the side, you move again your eyes to the front, but you're still monitoring that corner where you know that a cyclist is likely to come, and so on. I could give you hundreds of examples. I'll spare them for time's sake, but I would be happy to give you more examples afterwards. Now, if we allocate our attention there, voluntarily, we say that that's a covert, because it's without eye movements, covert voluntary spatial attention shift. But of course, things happen in our world that we don't have control of and that we cannot necessarily predict. So things happen in the environment that attract our attention automatically to. So while we keep looking at bold guy, something may happen, like a flash may happen on the left of the screen, and our attention may be transiently allocated there. So some of the places that we attend to are places that we want to allocate our attention. So for example, my father-in-law is here, and I want to see if he's awake and I'm kind of monitoring him, okay. <laughs> But other things happen, right? Someone just came on that side, someone waved at me, so my attention was allocated temporarily to that location. And we know a lot about how these voluntary and involuntary shifts of spatial attention happen, what they do. I'm just going to give you some examples. Let me just convince you that there's two different systems that we have to selectively process information. One of them is the voluntary system I talked about, which is called endogenous, because it depends on something that we decide to do, or goal-driven, is flexible, and I will explain in a moment what that means, but I'm actually capable of allocating attention to two different locations and allocating different proportion of resources, and it takes about 300 milliseconds to be allocated. This is for humans, for monkeys, for chicken, for every animal that has been studied. On the other hand, we have this system that is involuntary or exogenous, that is, it's stimulus-driven and it's automatic. It gets deployed fully whether we want it or not. And interestingly, it's very transient. It takes only about 100 milliseconds for us to deploy the system that is faster than we can move our eyes. And many labs, and my lab, have a number of studies where we have shown that these two systems are mediated by cortical and subcortical systems. And in most cases, but not in all, these two systems are going to result in similar perceptual consequences. But I'm actually going to show you a difference. Now, before I tell you a little bit more about these systems, I would like to think a little bit more about perception first, because what my lab is interested in doing is understanding how attention affects basic processes of visual information. So, if you recognize something here, please raise your hand. The people that are closer are more likely to see gala in the center of the screen here. The people that are farther are more likely to see Lincoln's face. Is that right? Actually, Salvador Dali was quite bright, and he gave us two hints of what we should see. Here's Gala's body, and here's Lincoln's face. Now, interestingly, every single pattern that is present in the environment is decomposed by our neurons in such a way that we code for its specific contrast, spatial frequency, orientation, and face. And here, I need, again, audience participation. I'm going to ask those to my left to close your eyes for the next screen, the next slide, until I tell you to open it. Ready? Those to my right, eyes open, please. Don't say what you see, just register what you see. Ready? Now we're going to switch. Those on the left, please open your eyes. 
Those on the right, close your eyes. Ready? Now everybody open your eyes, please. And you can just say what you see, okay? I want to hear tons of voices. Okay, some people said Einstein and some people said Marilyn Monroe. What happened here? Those of you that said Einstein is because you saw the picture on the left first. Those of you that said Marilyn Monroe saw the one on the right. Now, if you just go back and forth, literally, you're going to see more of one and less of the other. Again, if you squint, we all love Einstein, but it's not as beautiful as Marilyn. If you squint, you see more of Marilyn and less of Einstein, right? Now, this is a hybrid figure in which Odo Liva took all the spatial frequencies of these images and merged the high spatial frequencies that correspond to Einstein and the low spatial frequencies that correspond to Marilyn Monroe. This is another example by a colleague of mine, Peter Tse, um, that has shown that attention also alters brightness. So if I ask you to fixate on the white central dot, and without moving your eyes to attend to the bottom circle, you're going to see that subjectively changes. You see it as being darker and as being farther away. And if now you shift your attention to any of the circles on the top, you'll see that the brightness of the one on the bottom changes. OK, so nothing is changing in the stimulus. The information in the retina is exactly the same. It's just what you are attending to voluntarily that is making a difference. Now, while we do these kinds of experiments, we're actually seeing what happens in your brain. And in particular, what happens in the occipital cortex, which is here at the back of the brain. Again, because we are interested in seeing how it is that attention affects the processing of information. And after the information has gone through the retina to the lateral geniculonucleus, nucleus, it arrives to the back of the brain, which is highlighted there to the occipital cortex. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have our observers laying down in an MRI scanner. Many of you may have had MRIs for a multitude of reasons. Some of you may have had a functional magnetic resonance imaging. And the only difference is that now we can see what is the activity of the brain while people are perceiving a particular stimulus. And when we work with vision, we have an amazing um, advantage because the information is represented retinotopically. That means that two things that are neighbors in the outside world are also neighbors in my cortex. So what we can do is have people looking at that red dot. We have those expanding rings, and you see on the back of the brain how the information is traveling. The more central the stimulus is, the farther to the back, and the more peripheral it is, the more anterior. This is happening on real time. So we can localize with very high precision any stimulus and see where the activity is in the brain. Here you see that when that dial in red arrow is on the right, the, the activity is on the left, and when it's on the left, the activity is on the right because all the visual information crosses to the other hemisphere. So we can, with a precision of two cubic millimeters, see where exactly each information is represented in your brain. And once we do that, we can prescribe some slides, like here on the bottom, so that we see how the activity in this occipital cortex is altered as people perform visual perception tasks or attention tasks. And we know that there's many visual areas all on the back of your brain that specialize in processing different information. V1, for example, processes orientation, V4 processes color, and so forth. And then, of course, the brain has to synthesize the information. And we also have ways to inflate the brain, so to speak, so that all the information that is represented in the creases is available to us, and we can see how things that are contiguous in the outside world are also contiguous in the surface. 
Now, we take into account the fact that we know that if we have a very faint pattern, like the one on the left, there's little activity on the brain. But as the stimulus contrast increases, as in the right, you see that the activity is higher. That's because the neurons are firing more. When the neurons are firing more, they have a higher energetic cost, the blood has to go to those regions to replenish, and what we pick up with the MRI is the difference in oxy and the oxygenated blood. And the more blood that goes to an area, the more we know that that area was used. Is that clear? So the question is, is it always the best for the system to have optimal resolution? So here we have a painting by Serrat, and depending on where you are sitting, how far you are, how good your eyes are or your glasses are, there may be a preferred representation for you to see the face. There's going to be faces that we can hardly make up and there's, because they're too small, but there's going to be faces that we can hardly make up because we actually see the dots. So this is just to illustrate that sometimes it's better not to have an enhanced resolution but actually probably to have a lower resolution. Thank you so much. <laughs>